Good afternoon, uh, everybody, and welcome to another uh, ResPublica seminar, uh, this time on post-Brexit trade in food and its impact on British food security. We're delighted to, to have you uh, with us. We're also thrilled to have uh, the minister, Minister Ranald J. Wardner, um, who will outline the government's position. And then we've got some wonderful panelists who I'll introduce uh, at each stage uh, to speak after the minister has spoken. What I'd like to do at this seminar is to move from uh, the granular uh, to the general or from the particular to, to the universal. Um, I'd like to discuss, first of all, the post-Brexit arrangements uh, with the EU, then move to the more global <clears throat> impact uh, in terms of the future trade deals we're likely to strike uh, in the near future with New Zealand, with Australia, quite possibly in the middle distance with, with America and indeed the rest of the world. Then I want to go on to the more general aspects of trade and, and food and what we want from trade and what we want from British domestic food policy and whether indeed the two are aligned. And I hope to end on those fascinating general questions that I know are close to all of your hearts around um, how can trade help equity? Now we know of course on the, on the aggregate level, it's clear that free trade has lifted millions out of poverty, but one of the issues in the developed world is we don't have a particularly good distributional system for the benefits that aggregate to the developed nations in terms of free trade. And much of that consequence economically has, has driven much of the recent politics. So I want us to sort of go from the particular issues to the general issues. And that way I hope we will actually be able to better interrogate the, the specific issues affecting the British food sector and what we want from it. So 2020, in terms of British food policy and British food and what we want from food and what we want from trade, it's probably not foolish to compare it to 1846, the uh, abolition of the Corn Laws, which you, you will all know is, uh, essentially become sort of the cause celeb of uh, the advantages of free market trade in food because it's essentially enabled the landed class uh, interest to be replaced by the democratic interest of people who wanted cheaper food. What's interesting about the paradigm that we're in now is in some ways that is no longer the main issue. It's not very clear that we can reduce the price of food much uh, at all anymore. There's only two places in the world uh, where food is, is cheaper uh, than uh, the UK, and that I believe is Singapore and the United States. So we don't, there's marginal gains in that. In addition to which, there's mass public support for higher standards in food uh, production, in environmental concerns, in animal welfare, and food safety, uh, for want of uh, a better uh, phrase. And so what people want from trade is no longer what they wanted from trade. There are, to, to corner phrase, uh, many externalities which are now asked of trade and asked of trade deals, which in many ways, the current architecture of trade deals aren't particularly well suited uh, to deliver or speak to. And I think that some of the tensions um, I would like us to explore in, in this. So let me give you um, an example. So in 1999, uh, the UK banned um, sow stalls in pig farming. And it did that worthily and rightly because of concerns about animal welfare and cruelty. Unbeknownst, I think, to many, um, Danish bacon is produced largely with sow stools and is imported into Britain um, without any major problems. Now, what happened to the UK um, uh, pig industry is essentially, in terms of capacity, it was decimated. Um, it, it essentially 
uh, suffered huge uh, losses because it simply couldn't compete with that model. And this is because under current trade rules, uh, you can't really object to how things are produced. You can only object to things if they are a danger, a genuine danger to public health. So straight away, we have a conflict between um, the principles, if you like, of trade policy and the principles, if you like, of um, domestic policy. Now, nobody who, who believes in intellectual coherence uh, would want us to essentially uh, subject our own farmers to standards that we are not subjecting imports to, not least because all we will do is export cruelty or export poor animal welfare because we will essentially make it advantageous to other domains to produce more um, with less in terms of animal welfare, if you see what I mean. So it's a very interesting time, I imagine, to be uh, doing trade uh, deals, which and I think we've got to compliment the department. They've really had been doing magnificently in terms of not just recapitulating the deals that we've had with the EU, but moving at speed and scale, which surely given the UK's position, it is to be widely welcome. But I think what the what I want us to address here is using specific examples. What is trade for? Or to put another way, what do we want trade to deliver in terms of outcomes? If our, and I repeat myself, so, so apologies, but if our requests of trade are no longer slightly cheaper food, but actually a net rise in animal welfare standards, a net uh, reduction in um, CO2 production, uh, where we don't want to encourage, for instance, uh, the raising of cattle on land cleared from rainforests in South America, for example. And how then, and what I'd be very, really interested in exploring with the minister uh, and with panelists is how on earth do we then achieve the undoubted advantages of open uh, free trade without essentially increasing those negative externalities that the British public clearly uh, want to mitigate and want to ameliorate. And that's why I think where we are at the moment with this unprecedented amount of success and scale and energy that we're seeing um, from the minister's department and, uh, and from the minister is to explore further what are the principles. Uh, and we have uh, here, we have uh, representatives from the industry, from the NFU, from the British Poultry Council, to talk about, fears is the wrong word, but to talk about the genuine concerns. We're lucky to ha have one of the leading academics uh, on food and trade uh, policy uh, with us, uh, Dr. Garazola, who I um, will apologize for mispronouncing her surname, but who will, who will inform us later. And we're also very grateful to have um, one, one, I think, one of the most able ministers uh, in the government to talk about trade, what we want from trade and the issues um, that, that are now arising. And I know from previous discussions with the minister that one of the issues I want us to, to address are the distributional issues. How do we make trade benefit ordinary people? And I realize this is a contested field, but the fact it's even contested tells you that there are significant bits of counter evidence um, where we can show that those lower down uh, the social economic scale have essentially given up wages, job security, economic self-sufficiency in exchange for cheaper consumer goods. Now, in, in the context of food, which is what we're focusing on here, the externalities that the British people want are food security, quality, animal welfare and environmental standards. And they're quite hard things to attain through trade deals. So we're, we're all ears really to hear how the government might square this circle. So I'd once more like to, to welcome Minister Jair Wardner and over to you, Minister, and thank you for joining us. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, it's uh, very kind of you uh, to introduce me in such a way, but uh, your uh, uh, viewers today, uh, all the attendees will be the judge of it themselves. Uh, by the end, uh, they may come to a different conclusion, but uh, it is a, a great pleasure to join you uh, all the same, um, as we really do look ahead, uh, as you say, to the future of trade 
uh, for Britain's world-class uh, food and drink producers. I mean, I think it will be clear from your introduction and uh, to all uh, present that this is a really diverse industry, but together it is very close to uh, our hearts and uh, of course the stomachs of the British people uh, across this country. Each year we devour millions of tonnes of uh, superb produce that's uh, grown, uh, reared, uh, brewed, processed uh, uh, across uh, every nation and every corner uh, of our United Kingdom. And so it's not just uh, our uh, affection, uh, indeed it's not even just our appetites that this uh, fantastic uh, sector helps satisfy. Uh, I could observe that from the vineyards of Kent to the whiskey distilleries of Scotland, uh, the sheep farms of uh, Wales and the dairy farms of Northern Ireland, British food and drink uh, really plays a pivotal role in shaping and managing our beautiful countryside and forging our sense of a national identity. Plus, it drives economic growth, it creates jobs, and it fosters innovation in communities the length and breadth of our country. And our brilliant uh, British food and drink producers are setting uh, new benchmarks for excellence worldwide. Global consumer demand for quality and variety uh, is generating more than £23 billion pounds worth of exports from this sector in 2019 alone. And this government is determined to grow our food and drink exports and bring benefits uh, of global commerce to sectors across the economy, but also to people across our country as we plot a new path for ourselves as an independent trading nation on the world stage. As we are building this bright future uh, on, I would contend, very solid foundations, uh, it's right to observe that the trade deal that uh, this government secured with the EU does provide certainty for our food and drink, uh, drink producers, including zero tariff and zero quotas. Uh, and it allows uh, the United Kingdom and our uh, European friends to cooperate uh, on avoiding unnecessary barriers to trade. Now, the implementation of this agreement is being led, I should say, by the Cabinet Office with the uh, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Michael Gove, working hard to engage with the EU on resolving uh, some outstanding issues with the Northern Ireland Protocol and, and such like. But crucially, this deal sets Britain free to explore the new export opportunities across the globe. And we are determined to use this superb opportunity to really unleash uh, global trading potential of British businesses as we forge stronger bonds of prosperity with dynamic markets worldwide. The fantastic free trade agreements that we are securing, I'm pleased you've referenced them already, Philip, uh, with international partners are critical to this endeavor. And we have signed more than 63 uh, countries uh, through trade deals with uh, that covering uh, trade worth over 200 billion pounds a year. And that excludes the EU, which takes it well over 880 billion pounds a year. And the FTA we signed with Japan, for example, uh, includes tariff reductions on key agricultural produce, uh, such as pork and salmon, and it allows more world famous uh, British products to receive protected uh, recognition. Uh, from just uh, seven under the EU-Japan deal to potentially more than 70 as part of our United Kingdom Japan FTA, uh, which could include English sparkling wine, Scotch beef and Welsh lamb. And the continuity agreements that we have secured with partners worldwide, uh, from Chile to South Korea to Singapore, uh, will make sure that any preferential tariffs have been rolled over, including for poultry, dairy, and other key agricultural uh, sectors, uh, preserving the terms of trade and these existing trade flows. Meanwhile, uh, the uh, new FTAs that we have in the pipeline with other nations promise to deliver even more for our economy. They are opening up new dynamic markets uh, for brilliant British exports from poultry to lamb, from beef to alcoholic beverages, and they are in demand overseas. An FTA with the US could, for example, remove tariffs on up to 25% of British exports, such as cheddar cheese, uh, whilst the deal that we are working to secure with Australia could reduce tariffs on our key drinks exports, such as whiskey and gin. I can assure all folks on this call that we will stand firm in our negotiations with other nations 
to make sure that any future trade deals support the livelihoods of British farmers, provide value for money for British consumers, and do not low, uh, lower in any way our world leading British health production and animal welfare standards. Indeed, uh, to the contrary, we are determined to use our new freedoms to make sure that the United Kingdom remains at the forefront of progress in this arena, setting new standards of excellence. And a superb example of this is in organic farming, in which uh, Britain is already a global champion, and yet we can still do more. Free trade will help this innovative sector catalyze on international demand for our high quality, sustainably grown organic produce, um, and it will build on Britain's reputation for quality and it will drive exports whilst keeping costs down for British consumers. And this government believes that removing barriers to trade not only makes economic sense, but it is the right thing to do morally too, as we place core British values such as fairness and liberty and the rule of law at the heart of our trade policy. These are values that uh, my department is working to promote as we seek to kickstart export-led growth across our economy, including for our food and drink producers, as we recover from what have been the seismic impacts of COVID-19. Now, in June last year, our Minister uh, for Exports, uh, Graham Stewart, in collaboration with DEFRA's Food Minister, Victoria Prentice, announced the Agriculture Food and drink COVID recovery plan, which aims to boost trade and investment across the industry through a series of measures, including uh, launching a food and drink e-commerce accelerator pilot scheme for uh, SMEs, uh, creating 50 food and drink export champions across the United Kingdom who are working to get more British businesses in this sector trading and uh, running great uh, DIT food and drink exporting masterclasses, uh, giving budding British exporters the advice and the guidance that they might need to succeed in the global market. Meanwhile, DIT's expanding network of international trade advisors based across our country and around the world are providing the support, the advice, the capabilities that businesses of all sizes and all kinds require to enter new markets, connect with new customers, and promote their products overseas. And the export growth plan that we launched earlier this year includes a 38 million pound internationalization fund, which will help up to 7,600 small firms in England grow their trading operations. We've created an export academy to support British SMEs uh, as they get ready to do business with uh, partners worldwide for the first time. And our export credit agency, UKEF, is providing crucial financial backing that's uh, required sometimes to make sure that no viable British export fa uh, fails through uh, the lack of finance. So as we look ahead at what I think are really exciting prospects for international trade and investment that lie before us, this government will help set British businesses free to harness their exporting potential fueling our economic recovery, bringing jobs, growth and prosperity to every part of our United Kingdom, helping us level up opportunity across our nation. We'll be opening up new markets for British exports, uh, overcoming those barriers to trade and putting the needs of British businesses and consumers first in everything that we do, ensuring that the wonderful food and drink harvested uh, across our beautiful land and from the seas around us can be enjoyed by many millions more uh, around uh, the globe. The future of British food and drink is to my mind global. The opportunities for trade-led growth are vast. So I say, let's go forward. Uh, let's go forward together, uh, government and industry side by side to embrace this new age and succeed. unmute. Thank you very much, Ranel. Um, very, very interesting and, and wonderful, of course, to hear once again the government's commitment that we're not going to surrender on, on, on our standards. Um, just to, to a ask you one question on that, how are you going to do that um, with reference to the 
the sales stall point from um, earlier in 1999. Um, how, how are we going to preserve our standards while still strike free trade deals? What is the mechanism by which you think we can, we can attain or achieve that, uh, Minister? Well, we've already done it. I mean, we struck those deals with more than 63 countries around the world, and those have not uh, lowered our standards in any way. It's worth observing the process that trade deals go through, uh, that uh, you know, Parliament can, of course, uh, through the CRAG process, and I apologise, uh, the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act process, uh, can uh, vote uh, against a trade deal. Um, but equally, uh, a legislation that changes uh, any of our domestic standards would have to go through Parliament in the usual way as primary legislation. So Parliament has a lock. That is how um, uh, we can be clear that there would be the pro appropriate scrutiny uh, over uh, any uh, changes if any future government wanted to do so. But we are proud, as I say, of our world leading food, health and animal welfare standards, and we're not going to lower our standards. No, sorry, I, I, my apologies. I, I probably wasn't being clear. Um, it's, it's clear that we won't lower our standards, but what, what isn't clear is that others will be forced to raise theirs. So as, as you know, and as, as, as has been discussed, you know, it's very difficult to insist on how things are produced, mirror how things are produced in the UK. So we can be in a situation where we don't lower our standards, but in effect, we, we on, on an aggregate level, increase uh, or diminish standards because we suck in imports that are cheaper produced to lower standards. I'm just wondering in, in those situations, what mechanisms you might employ to ensure that the food that is imported mirrors our own standards of production. I'm thinking of tailored certification processes that, that are open between bilateral, bilaterally within um, FTAs. Well, I, I, I would perhaps come back to the point that uh, you know, we are promoting those robust food standards nationally and internationally uh, to protect consumer interests. The consumer, the British consumer is smart. And uh, you referenced earlier, for example, some of the challenges in parts of South America. Uh, you referenced some of the challenges uh, that uh, are faced to our environment as a result of uh, the methods of production in some parts of the world, uh, beyond indeed South America. And um, supermarkets, for example, have already been acting on that. So the consumer's voice is a very loud one. Uh, that's why we, when we say we remain committed to promoting robust food standards, we maintain our own standards. That uh, sets, I think, a very clear direction of travel. And the consumer is discerning in what they buy. The consumer wants to have confidence in the food they buy. And I know re retailers take that very seriously too. But you will also, um, of course, understand that it would be wrong for me to tread on the toes of uh, DEFRA, um, who are uh, more directly responsible for, uh, sort of food standards uh, within the United Kingdom. Okay, I'll, I'll return to this because it is one of the issues we raised, but, but let me uh, now turn to Richard Griffiths, uh, who's chair of the British Poultry Council. If I could remind, um, or rather remark that on Twitter, our hashtag is food trade. If you want to follow the tweets, do please use it. Richard, um, thank you very much for joining us and over to you to talk about your concerns and in response to the minister. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Philip, and, and thank you, Minister. I think that's uh, a very good, expansive summary of the aspirations of where government is at the moment. Um, but I'm going to start, as, as Philip suggested, rather from the granular. Um, and the first thing I'd like to say is that food production in the UK and the food security that comes from healthy trade adding to food, food production in the UK, the purpose is to feed people. It seems a very simple thing to say, but we sometimes lose, lose sight of the fact that people, everybody has to eat. In the poultry meat sector, we're in a position where poultry, and particularly chicken, is half the meat that this country eats and is the core protein for a large number of people, both because it's quality 
but because it's also affordable. We are now in a time where we are facing what are hopefully some temporary challenges with the new UK EU agreement. And it's worth illustrating some of those at the granular level. I think we, like, like many other sectors, have, have been facing the challenges of, that can be summarised perhaps with the now famous phrase, welcome to the Brexit, sir. The coloured stamps, the wrong coloured stamps, the wrong page numbers on documentation, the sheer amount of documentation that has led to rejects loads when entering the EU. I'm not going to hold these up as a, as a permanent barrier because they're not, but they're indicative of a system that was never designed for short distance, just in time, perishable goods. We need to fix that system and we will. People are learning and traders are learning to deal with the new normal. But no, the new normal is not necessarily a good thing. I think where we have to look now, because getting around a system or making the best of a system that really does very little but add cost to production, is we need to be very clear about what that means, both for broader trade and for our domestic production consumption. As, as has already been mentioned, we're in a position where we have left the closest possible trading relationship with countries that share our standards and values. And in that period, we had the trading markets were balanced in terms of cost of production, cost of trade, the value that comes out of trade. What we're starting to see now is bit by bit, an increase to the costs of production, both in terms of the additional documentation, but also the, the friction that we are seeing. So when you look at UK consumption and particularly chicken meat, that is a staple, the effect of small costs of production can have an enormous and long lasting effect. So from trade and for the poultry meat sector, three quarters of our trade in meat products is with EU states. What we really need from our trade relationship is to maintain value in that imports and particularly export trade. As I say, hopefully this short, these issues, these immediate issues will be short term and we can perhaps lift our heads a little to look at the slightly longer or medium and longer term ambitions and perhaps those might fit with some of the aspirations that the Minister has, has expressed. So what do we want from a broad, uh, wider trading relationship with the world? I think we, there are certain, for, certainly for our sector, there are certain markets that are, are crucial and uh, the, the very difficult problem of China would be probably be top of the list. Um, but uh, uh, markets like China, South Africa, for us, they are have great potential, not just for meat, but also for breeding stock, of which the UK is a global hub and world leader. At heart, though, it really does come back to standards and values, how we apply them domestically, how we, should we say, respect food production and the fact that it has to be accessible to everybody. 
I think government has a, a prime role to set the example for standards. It has a massive opportunity within its own public procurement systems to say, this is our stake in the ground of what we want standards to be and the standards that we'll defend. And then we will go out and sell those standards to the rest of the world. Logistical and administrative difficulties aside, Europe is going to re retain its status as our key marketplace and probably the easiest one to access because of our shared standards and values. But that really does bring the question as to what happens when there is no longer alignment in certain aspects. And then the much more difficult problem of further afield, how do we get, as Philip has already mentioned, how do we get those other countries to have this, recognize the, the values that we put into food production and therefore pay the cost of that food production, which in turn will support British farmers, British food producers, and ultimately allow a British population to eat quality, safe, affordable, wholesome food. We cannot treat trade as a, as a, as a thing in isolation. It's all connected. So I would like, just like to conclude that there is potential. I agree with the minister, there, there is potential, perhaps for us more, shall we say, focused than, uh, than, than other sectors might have, and other, certainly even other agricultural and food sectors might have. But there are opportunities if we can seize them. But the, the crucial element for us at the moment is how we manage the cost conundrum, whereby costs of production are increased with no greater return yet through trade. And we want to be the most sustainable agricultural sector. That's an, that's a, an ambition. All agricultural sectors do. But that is, the, that is a measure of UK food and farming, that we are on that track. Sustainability, quality, provenance in our production. I'll leave it there, Philip, on that positive note. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, here's the point. I don't doubt for a moment that the government will continue rightly to insist on high standards for domestic producers. But my question is, isn't about that. My question is always, what about the standards of the food we import? Because that's the issue. If we stay in a divergent world, whereby essentially foreign competitors don't have to apply our welfare standards for the sake of argument or our production standards, essentially we will develop a two tier food system where those who have enough money can afford to eat ethically and those who don't, won't. <clears throat> so the issue I think is, and, and I'll come back to this, I won't turn directly to you, Minister, I'll, I'll take other comments and, 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 and come back to you. But the issue really is, is how and in what manner have we and can we ensure that our imports, our food imports, are produced to similar standards so that British farmers aren't undercut and we end up having to fork out a subsidy. That seems to me to be the principled um, issue. We, we can't allow imports that are essentially have a massive competitive advantage because of standards um, to essentially create that, as I've already mentioned, two-tier food system. That seems to me to be the crucial question for British producers. Is that one shared by your members, Richard? Uh, yes, and, and I think the, the, the phrase two-tier food system sums it up perfectly. Uh, the, the danger of that is that production needs a critical mass. Once you start undercutting production, production shrinks, the efficiencies reduce, the, the economics become less viable. And as you say, the, it, it becomes a, a split and both economically, 
of these or that those who can afford and those who can't, but also uh, ethically. Yeah. So what, yeah, and, what and our and our view and we're and we would be selling our own ethical view, exporting it essentially. Yeah. And uh, well, th this is the point that you would then create um, where quality becomes more expensive because the economies of scale for high quality vanish because they've been undercut um, by le lower quality imports. That at least is a legitimate fear uh, whether or not that's in practice is, is what we will uh, kind of return to with the minister. So um, thank you very much Richard. I remind um, uh, viewers that do ask uh, Q&A uh, questions and, and I'll tell you if we're coming to them live and we'll put them to the panel and the minister. So do please, um, if you've got questions you'd like to raise, use that button on, on your bottom right to type in the questions. Um, so now it's a great pleasure uh, that I'm going to um, uh, Dr. Alicia Garazova, uh, 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 who will speak on some of the current issues that, that we face on Brexit uh, with food and the general issue of non-tariff barriers and what we might do about it. Uh, Alicia, over to you. Thank you very much, Philip. You, <laughs> you almost did it. You actually nailed the surname, but... Uh, Less of the first name, but I understand. So no worries. Um, Apologies, sincere. <laughs> thank Fair you so much yet. for <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really delighted to be joining you today from the Trade Policy Hub, based at the London School of Economics, where we actually have been conducting um, research into how the UK can navigate the trade landscape and secure um, the best deals in the future. Of course, um, this is an issue of huge importance to the UK. Um, only in this past week, we have seen the profound impact that trade policies can have on economic and social fabric, not only of the UK, but of multiple countries and also of um, international relations. Um, so as Philip said, today I'm here mostly to talk about non-tariff measures uh, and also some of the potential options to um, resolve them in the future, whether that's feasible or not. Um, and maybe pose some questions myself uh, for the future of um, UK uh, food and trade um, policy. Um, so where we are coming from is a study that we did in September 2020, where we looked at the expected impact of an FTA scenario and of a no back Brexit scenario, which uh, luckily we're um, not in. But um, what we what we declared then and still hold, hold very closely is that, of course, even in an FTA scenario, there are still complex barriers to trade and increased costs, just as we heard now on the, for, from the poultry sector, just because, of course, the UK is moving from a situation of being um, a member of the customs union and single market to a lesser form of integration. Um, so such actions have, as we know, both direct and indirect effects. Um, in, in terms of direct effects, again, on the, from the poultry side, we, we know that finished products imported from trade partners become more costly, or even in the future, less available due to the increased costs. But also there is, of course, an indirect effect, which is linked to the intermediate inputs required to produce final goods. So here we're talk, talking about the inputs that go into domestic food and beverage manufacturers. So potentially increasing the cost of domestically produced consumer goods. Thus, as we know, affecting both supply demand and also supply chains. So what do we talk about when we talk about those indirect effects? We usually look at um, some of those intermediate inputs that go into the food and beverage industry. So aluminum, pharmaceutical goods, fertilizers. These are all things that uh, our manufacturers use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so as we can see, um, quite a bit of um, effect on, on that side. So as we heard, while tariffs have been avoided for those goods which qualify under the um, TCA, um, there are two types of costs that remain um, and, um, and will um, in some ways persist, barriers at the border and the barriers behind the border. And I would like to turn to some of the key ones briefly. Of course, we cannot name them all. Um, we've read a little bit about them this week. 
Uh, but I just want to sort of outline some of the ones that um, cause some of the major costs. And as we heard this week, one of those areas is um, the rules of origin. Um, so the rules of origin, as we know, are used by custom authorities to understand whether um, a good which is traded internationally has come from a specific origin or, or not, because that would require them, the imposition of an appropriate tariff level. So the good thing is, of course, that the EU and the UK have attempted to reduce immediate burden by agreeing of a grace period, let's call it, for the first year. Um, so exporters are not actually required to provide all of this evidence immediately. But this doesn't mean that they don't have to comply. And they still have to. And they, we, they still have to understand the provenance of all of the goods and keep an audit trail and make sure that that's, um, um, that's yeah, uh, kept for, um, for, future, um, for future submissions. So um, in this way, the, the idea of the EU-UK agreement is to really benefit only those goods that legitimately can be called European and you, those um, that are from, from the United Kingdom. And as we know, these are not just specific to the, uh, to the TCA. These, these, are, um, these are clauses in all FTA, so nothing, nothing unusual here. But also because they exist, we know the studies around them um, also explain the cost that uh, they bring. So the cost of compliance can be really high, especially for those goods that have more complex um, supply chains, less, of course, relevant for, um, for the, the export of raw goods, uh, but less, a lot more so for, for those, as I said, complex supply chains. Um, so in, in some of the studies that we have looked to, at firms that find it really costly to um, to abide by those rules will just decide to pay the tariff, uh, which of course is not very efficient in, in, the, in the long term. Similarly, we can also look at the EU-Norway relations. That's one thing that we have looked into uh, within our study. So when it comes to the rules of origin documentation, um, firms say that this is one of the most costly components of trade uh, between the two. So I'm pointing this out to say that on this specific aspect of uh, barriers at the border, we can actually probably see that it is unlikely that the cost will go away over the next, next years. So companies will have to decide whether to comply, pay the tariff, or maybe even amend their supply chains. Um, so this is one aspect that we see being more and more present um, and um, for businesses, um, to tackle with that has become a lot more problematic. Um, another issue, of course, is the safety and security declarations, which is especially, especially important for the food and beverage um, industry. Um, so again, from previous studies, we know that companies who haven't previously traded outside of the EU um, find it really difficult um, to, to comply. So um, they might have to need even new internal workforce in order to deal with the declarations and documentation and everything else. Um, so initially, at least, that's, um, that's a matter of something to, um, for, them to, for them to build capacity, hopefully quickly. Uh, but we already see that a significant portion of the, um, the the, the food and beverage industry um, is concerned with fresh produce and, and, and this has been disproportionately affected over the past uh, month or so. So it's all about potential spoilages, shelf life, how do you manage to transport it most easily. So in a few extreme cases, some types of, um, some types of products might no longer be, um, be available. Um, but again, here, the most important thing is that this will have an effect on demand in the EU and the UK. So organizations will again have to think about how they set up their supply chains. Um, sanitary and phytosanitary measures that we have, again, heard a lot about in the past couple of weeks are complex and time consuming and very costly. And the TCA doesn't seem to provide um, a lot of extra leeway for the fact that it's um, UK suppliers that are involved in this instance. Dr. Um, Garazova, can I, can I ask a, a question here? So we've got this whole range of, of um, non-tariff barriers on an area in, with food that is normally subject to far more tariffs than, than any other goods. 
and we've got British food produced to very high standards. Is there no kind of way of smoothing this, both not just with the EU, but indeed um, globally? Um, what are the mechanisms one might follow to reduce those kind of non-tariff barriers? Because they seem to be quite penal for, for uh, British um, food producers. Um, I was going to get to the part that there, as you can hear, these are only two examples. So we're here talking only about uh, rules of origin and um, safety checks. And actually for each type is, is different. The type of solution that might be practical is different. And same goes to, so especially when you go into those behind the border, which relate to conformity regulations, they can even be very product specific. So we're no longer even talking about an industry solution. So, we're definitely not talking about a countrywide solution. We need either an industry solution or even a product specific solution in some cases. And the TCA provides for this. So other experts have pointed out this week that um, in, the, in um, the, our, the articles on sanitary and phytosanitary measure, there is a provision for possibly for some type of electronic certification or other type of technology, which would actually help with um, some of these processes. But the thing is that the TCA first have to be fully implemented, all of the committees have to be in place, and then the committee that works on the SPS issue might decide to implement that. So we're talking about, again, not something that could be immediately resolved, but that's just for sanitary and phytosanitary issues. So I really want to highlight the, this sort of dissimilarity across different products because we saw that in our study as well. We cannot just say, yes, there will be cost to all products because it's, it really varies some, some products and both intermediate and final goods are, are a lot less affected and, and could be dealt with in a much easier way. Um, so one of the things that, for example, I'm really keen to see what will happen is to see how the new task force on innovation growth and regulatory reform uh, might um, explore those new opportunities of the freedoms that exist as a result of the new relationship with the EU and see how those new regulations form in the future since that will be guiding. So actually in terms of the solution, I would say one thing that um, you mentioned before, but we are in a very unique circumstance in that we are moving from a situation of sort of very close deep integration to a shallower integration Whereas in most cases, of course, we know it's vice versa. So there is the potential for diversions on the UK side in the future. The good thing is that the TCA resembles FTAs in the way that it provides for scope for cooperation. It doesn't, um, it provides for different committees um, to be meeting on a regular basis. It provides on um, areas of convergence or areas where um, discussions might continue on how to do things um, in the future. So these are all very optimistic signs for some of the issues to be resolved. Um, but I just, before I am um, just wrapping up that I wanted to also ask, or at least pose three questions that I think that for me, they'll be the most important ones. And the first one is how do, um, how does the UK decide on its future trading partners? and what kind of consultation mechanisms there are with parliament and with stakeholders. So we're not talking only about businesses, but also consumers, civil society. We know that all of those issues that the minister mentioned are not only relevant for businesses, but also to consumers and civil society. Um, and then also, how do we make decisions on this new domestic regulation framework? Is it on what kind of evidence base do we plan to base that? That's really important to, to us. Um, and then, of course, how both will affect um, the link between trade and food in the future. So a lot of open questions. It will be very interesting to be um, to be part of this discussion. As you said, it is a good time to be uh, uh, sort of a trade analyst and to be following events. So um, thank you again. Thank you very much, Dr. May, most, most grateful. So let me now um, uh, turn to Nick von uh, Weston Holtz, who's the Trade and Policy Advisor for the National Farmers uh, Union. So Nick, um, if you wouldn't mind um, taking us, I think we, we've got quite a good granular handle and hopefully some of the principles and problems that have emerged, uh, we, we can now tackle. Can you sort of um, approach this at the more general level of, of how do we, sort of ensure that the principles that we have don't actually 
um, undermine both British producers and indeed uh, open up the world for those who've decided to compete with us precisely on welfare standards or the lack thereof. So uh, over to you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, yes, I'm, I think it's worth in order to, to do that properly, just taking a bit of a, a step back and um, considering the, the, the whole sort of policy environment that UK farming and to a degree that the broader food industry is now having to operate under and will be operating under over the next few years, because it's a very different system than what has been experienced for the last few decades. Um, Brexit has, led to um, some wide-scale reform, I guess, for, for UK agriculture, and we'll see whether that's for better or for worse. But it's certainly, um, I, I think, you know, perhaps barring the fishing sector, impacted agriculture more than any other part of the economy. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. Firstly, well, trade, trade policy, and we've obviously heard a lot about that. The the dependence on the UK food industry, on the EU as a, um, uh, a trading partner, that relationship is undergoing uh, significant restructuring. And those future trade deals we're negotiating with other countries and indeed the ones we've rolled over as well, uh, all of those will really adjust quite significantly the, 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 the trading environment for, uh, for UK food in the, in the years ahead. But beyond trade, you've got some other really significant policy changes, which all play into this wider question, the question you just asked. Um, we, of course, no longer subject to freedom of movement. Now, UK agriculture relied on a lot of um, overseas labour, particularly in some of the seasonal jobs. And that was primarily sourced from, from the EU, uh, where people could just come and take jobs very easily under freedom of movement. That has obviously stopped as of the 1st of January. We can have a long discussion, I, I suggest we don't have it now, but there are other places where there is a, a lot of debate and discussion about uh, our future immigration requirements and immigration policy. But what we do know is that the new immigration system has um, quite a different focus than that which existed previously. It's very much focused on um, higher wage, what is termed as higher skilled workers. I think lots of uh, uh, people in agriculture would um, challenge that notion that, that many of the jobs are, are not high skilled. But nevertheless, it's clear from a, just from a technical categorization that, that uh, the new immigration system is, is focused on people coming in to take up jobs, not in agriculture. And we've struggled for many years to, to get uh, workers in from the domestic workforce into agriculture. We even struggled this last year where there were campaigns to attract workers um, into, uh, into, into picking jobs, growing jobs, et cetera. So that, that remains a long-term challenge. There are some solutions beyond. It is related to our trade policy and our trade relations. Um, when we're looking at going sort of toe-to-toe -to -toe with big agricultural producers, uh, there's a question mark about what sort of immigration policy and labour policy um, is uh, appropriate for that. The other big area, of course, is, is our domestic agricultural policy, where we're no longer subject to the common agricultural policy of the EU, but instead we're developing a new policy, very much focused on uh, public money for public goods, quite unique probably across the globe if, if it's uh, deployed in that sense. Um, but the, the concern there is that focuses away from productivity and food production much more to environmental delivery. For example, nothing wrong with incentivizing and rewarding farmers for delivering environmental goods. But uh, I am concerned that if it focuses solely on that, that we suddenly have a, a farming sector in the UK which doesn't really produce food. Certainly, if it's aligned with that trade policy, as you've touched on, Philip, where, again, we're being asked to compete to, with some of the most competitive food producers in the world. Uh, it's raising standards, raising requirements, raising costs domestically, uh, where we're competing 
in a, in a much more competitive environment. So this is the context, the policy context uh, in which farmers are, are being asked to now to operate in the, in the years ahead. And uh, it's not impossible for them to do that. It's not impossible that they can, those policy contexts will, will be adapted in a way that promotes high standards, sustainable farming, but competitive farming as well. But it's a hell of a challenge. Uh, and I think we have to be, to be clear about that. And just sort of turn to trade where I think almost, the, as we've heard, it's the most kind of fundamental maybe uh, changes uh, are coming, which could impact uh, agricultural markets in the UK. Um, as, as has already been touched on by a couple of the speakers, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that despite Brexit, despite the, the barriers that have been put up um, with trade with the EU, um, that the EU will remain a massively important market for UK agriculture. Um, and the, uh, the fact that there is a market of 450 million people there um, on our doorstep um, is, is something, you know, geography is a fact of geography. So, so will remain a, an, important, uh, an important market. It's therefore very encouraging, but we, we were very pleased that the TCA announced on Christmas Eve, um, uh, got rid of all uh, uh, tariffs, a zero tariff deal, notwithstanding uh, the comments uh, we heard about rules of origin and other technical problems now in making sure that you qualify for those zero tariffs. But nevertheless, that, that is obviously really good, uh, uh, an important thing. But other than that, we are now a third country with the EU. Uh, we're out of the customs union single market. We've known that for some time, but it is creating uh, friction. Um, so one of the things that that, that is, has meant is, is turning to rest of the world trade as if it is a replacement for the EU market. And I think it's very important it is not seen that way. It needs to be seen to supplement uh, uh, that market. We should really be taking a holistic view of trade, uh, looking at how we can trade smoothly, as seamlessly as possible with the EU, with the USA, with Australia, New Zealand, and indeed many other countries. We should be looking at in the round and being strategic about that. It's not straightforward because there are tensions particularly regulatory tensions uh, in trading with the different blocks, but certainly it's possible. And that's how we should be, uh, we should be looking, uh, looking forward, how we can trade with the EU and the rest of the world. But turning to that rest of the world piece, um, just a couple of reflections. Firstly, um, this shouldn't just be about doing free trade deals. Actually, if we're looking at the opportunities for farmers here in the UK overseas, Often what that requires is real technical expertise and uh, feet on the ground to unlock market access barriers that might exist. So SPS barriers, uh, other uh, barriers to trade, uh, to open up opportunities and to promote British produce so that we can actually grab some of those overseas markets a little bit a little bit more effectively. So it shouldn't, it's not just about FTAs, but of course FTAs are happening. Uh, totally acknowledge the fact that there is a, a manifesto commitment to, to doing FTAs. It is a little concerning that the priority countries we are doing free trade deals with are uh, the, some of the biggest agricultural exporters across the globe. Um, we heard a little bit about what we were, the question that was just asked about um, you know, what, what is the, the process for identifying trade partners. Um, it's not quite clear to me what that process was back in the day, three years ago, when Australia, New Zealand and the US were all pinpointed, because those guys are pretty much the most efficient and effective agricultural exporters in the world, pretty effective trade negotiators as well. So, you know, in a way, kudos to the British government. It's, uh, it dived in at the, at the deep end a little bit and, and, and you know, so far um, has, has done, you know, I think pretty, pretty well, as it has done with the rollover deals, which uh, uh, have been a great success, success story of DIT, uh, making sure that those countries we had trade deals with previously have been maintained. Um, and so, um, as I say, a really important aspect of the, of the government's trade trade policy, although 
again, it's, it is worth saying they are not, there are little issues in, in some of those trade deals, which make life a little bit harder for agricultural producers. So um, I, I think we need to be, to be clear as we negotiate with these big agricultural producers, we need to be clear actually with our farmers here in the UK, what the reality of that is. They uh, look at the UK market as 65, 70 million people, however many people there are now, relatively affluent, uh, hugely attractive uh, agricultural market. They want access to that. They want to be able to uh, have a slice of that market. And if we go right back to basics of trade policy and trade theory, the reason you do trade deals is predicated on there being winners and losers. At a macro level, you hope it's all winners. Everybody's a winner. But at a micro level, you must have winners and losers. There's no point in actually doing a trade deal if you haven't got some losers. They've got to specialise under comparative advantage in what they do best. You specialise in what you do best. Maybe over the medium to long term, people retrain, you move people around the economy. But there have to be losers. So we need to be honest and clear about that in these trade deals with big agricultural producers. We need to work out what our domestic policy ought to do to mitigate that um, and to um, allow help producers adjust if they need to, for example. And we also need domestic policy that incentivizes productivity and allows farmers to be more competitive or certainly encourages them to be more competitive. And I come back to that point about our domestic policy incentivizing public goods. Yes, it can incentivize public goods. It can certainly incentivize sustainable farming, but it has to be about food production. Otherwise, we get to the point, Philip, you raised yourself, where all we're actually doing is producing less food on our own shores, more expensively, importing more food from overseas, uh, produced to, to different standards. And I would just finish by saying I absolutely respect the minister's uh, uh, um, pledge around standards. Uh, it's been really reassuring to hear it repeatedly from the government that they are, they really do understand this is an issue and they are very committed to, to that. But it is not just about the standards we have here as UK farmers. It is about the standards of the food we import. And once you start removing tariffs, as we will be doing, as we have do these deals, then the ability to control the standards of that food which is being imported becomes much more difficult. In some situations, essentially legally at least, impossible. So we need to be absolutely on the, yeah, absolutely clear when we reduce tariffs and give people tariff-free access, what we are giving them tariff-free access for. Uh, and that, that is ultimately the, 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 the key here. I'll finish there, Philip. No, th uh, thank you uh, very much, Nick. And I think, you did an admirable summary there, um, which uh, and I'll come to you shortly, uh, Minister. So I think if I can, if I can synthesize the questions from the panel before we go to the audience, it's really this is what are the standards for food imports such that if we insist on welfare standards for our domestic producers and don't insist on welfare standards for the imports, which as Nick noted, it's very difficult to do under WTO rules because it's very hard to challenge uh, the way you produce goods uh, or food rather than uh, the food itself outside of public health. But the danger then is you remove the economies of scale from the current high, high value, high quality, high welfare British food production because it's undercut by imported, undercut by imported goods that don't abide by those standards. And it becomes therefore more expensive to produce, therefore more expensive to buy. Therefore, we essentially institute a two tier food system. Well, those for whom price is an issue buy the lower welfare uh, goods produced with the internationally with the externalities that the British government rightly wants to minimize domestically. So let me give you an example of where the EU uh, essentially responded. And this is when uh, in the, the hormone beef um, 
scenario. Back in 1981, the EU um, banned hormone reared beef from the USA. And under Reagan, there were retaliatory tariffs and a long fight. But the EU stuck to its guns and essentially then opened up what I was trying to refer to earlier about a, a sector specific deal where they allowed non hormone treated beef, grain fed beef into the EU as a way of resolving that. And I think what would be very reassuring to British food producers is hearing from the government that they were prepared to defend welfare standards in that way for the imports that are coming in. Because if the government does that, then the government is standing by its requirements and, and its statements, which we all support. But the danger is, if the government isn't prepared to, to insist to the extent that it can um, on similar standards for imports, then essentially British food producers are being sacrificed uh, to no net welfare gain. So I'll turn, that seems to be, if you forgive me, Minister, the, the general thrust of, of the concern. May I turn to you and then we'll turn to the questions. Um, thank you very much, Minister. Sure, Philip. Um, look, I'm uh, uh, perfectly happy to answer the question. I just don't agree with the premise of it. And uh, I, I've been very clear about that in my remarks and also in my first answer. Um, you know, I, let, let's cover a few things. Um, in terms of what Richard said earlier, in, I'll come back to standards in a sec, but uh, I think it's important to look at this overall context which has been raised. You know, the new normal um, is the normal. Um, you know, we have left the European Union and the sooner that everyone uh, recognises that and moves on, the better. So it's about seizing the opportunities uh, from uh, our departure from the EU, rather than perhaps reflecting on what we had before and what we don't have now. It's what can we now get that we ought to all be focused on. Uh, there was uh, um, uh, some references to rules of origin uh, earlier as well. And, you know, yes, the trading system has changed. Um, for sure, it has changed. Um, but equally, um, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd sort of uh, just reference that uh, only one in five uh, food and drink uh, businesses actually exports today. And so I think there's a huge uh, opportunity for not only the four in five who don't export to start exporting to the world on what is a more level playing field than ever before, because we've got the same uh, sort of approach now, rather than being part of uh, the EU. Uh, we've got the same approach, the same possibilities with all markets. Um, but uh, indeed for the one in five, um, if they haven't exported um, beyond the EU before, I think it's again looking at the opportunities there where rules, rules of origin um, uh, sort of, and the implications of leaving the EU uh, aren't as relevant. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that I dispute what has been said around the EU being an important market still. Of course it is. That's why we went to get the TCA. Um, and, uh, you know, the zero tariff, zero quota basis is unprecedented. The EU has never agreed such a deal with anyone else ever before. Um, and that is good news uh, for uh, businesses in, in the agri-food sector. I think the deal provides certainty um, and uh, more than anything, that's what you want. Now, I appreciate there are still uh, some discussions underway um, and, uh, you know, clearly there are committees to be set up and so on. Sure, fine, but at least there is a clear direction of travel as to where we are going. Um, and I hope that that is, uh, that is helpful. On the um, uh, standards point though, and uh, so thank you for, for your latitude there, uh, but on the standards point, um, I, our standards that we have today outside the European Union are exactly the same as we had when we were in the EU. That's what we have done. That's what the uh, European Union Withdrawal uh, Act did. Uh, in the 2018 Act, it transferred all existing uh, food safety provisions, uh, including import requirements uh, that, the, that we had as the UK when we were a member of the EU, onto our own domestic statute book. And that includes the ban on uh, artificial growth hormones um, uh, in uh, domestic and imported products, uh, as one example, um, and uh, the, the uh, indeed the chlorine washed chicken uh, example that has been oft cited uh, incorrectly in the press. Um, uh, you know, these things are banned in terms of standards. Um, and therefore, I would contend 
that we are upholding those um, those standards in our domestic context, but also appropriately from a trade perspective. And one statistic that your attendees might not be aware of um, when they hear this debate or they read about it in the press, you know, when we were part of the EU in 2019, and I use the 29 fig uh, figure uh, for that reason, 24% of our chicken came from Thailand. You know, so that that's Thai food sta uh, food production standards but they, they were sold to the EU market of which we were part, and 24% of our chicken came from Thailand because it met our food standards. And I, I think it's important that we uh, put this in a context of, it's not all because we have now left the European Union and left the transition period that the world has changed. Actually, there were imports coming in before that met our standards, and that was perfectly deemed perfectly appropriate by industry and by... Um, um, uh, uh, people across our country at that time and we will uphold the standards to that end and the last thing if I may uh, Philip um, you know the economies of scale will be maintained in Britain because people around the world want to buy they want to buy high quality produce in the markets I'm working with in uh, India in the Gulf you know, they want to buy high quality British produce and that is why there will be economies of scale for British industry uh, with the highest of standards that we all want here in Britain and we should be proud of. And, and perhaps a parallel example is, you know, you wouldn't expect uh, a, a Jaguar and a Ford car to be the same price, uh, but people will still buy Jags because they want that higher quality product. And that's a good thing. And we allow the consumer to make that, that decision. And the consumer has responded globally to want to buy uh, British produce. So I think the future is very bright. Thank you very much, Minister. It's a fascinating discussion and I would go on, but, it, but, but I won't because, because we, we, ha we have questions pressing. So um, can I turn to Richard Kay? Uh, Richard, can you ask your question um, of, the, of the Minister and the panel and I'll I'll take a, a few questions first and then we'll we'll go to you all. Um, and Richard, when you come on, do remember to unmute. So, uh, Mike, can you transfer Richard to ask his question, please? Yeah, Richard should be online. Richard, can you unmute, please? Oh, there it is. Apologies. You're good, yeah. Richard. Carry on. My, my question was... Uh, relating to um, neonicotides and um, the European Union banned all oilseed rape from being treated by um, neonicotides in 2018, which was a good thing because that was about protecting bees. But since then, certainly the UK has, um, oilseed rape crop has been decimated by about 40%. And the point is that <clears throat> oilseed rape is still imported by countries that are still allowed to um, apply that that um, that particular chemical, so it, it's it's not about the food that's coming in; it's about the uh, the ingredients. So I, I feel it, it's it's not when we talk about food imports, we're not allowing um, like for like to be um, be measured in, in that way, and uh, it just feels really unjust. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Richard, and. Uh, then we'll go to MP. I don't know what that stands for, but we'll we'll soon find out. Uh, um, MP, uh, could you please come on and uh, answer your question? Ask uh, your question. Philip uh, Maxence is the first name, but I think Maxence has just dropped out of the event. So the question was: How will the government address regulatory divergence? with the EU on agricultural and food standards. And I think here's, this is one of the interesting points looking forward around innovation. You, one could think of gene editing, you know, and, and one could imagine with the relative success of the British biotech sector and innovation within, um, within that, that that will be one of the, um, the different uh, approaches. Um, so, that's another question for the minister. I'll take a I've got Graham Deer. Graham, could you come on and answer your question, please? Mike, could you facilitate, please? Yeah, I'm bringing Graham in now. And Graham, if you, yeah, unmute, yeah. please. Thanks. 
Hi, thanks. Uh, Graham Deer, I'm also from the British Poultry Council. In fact, I'm the chairman, Richard's the CEO. Um, my question is, why don't we take a different approach to some of the consultations? We've recently had a consultation on welfare transport uh, in the UK, and we end up in a situation where academics or government officials, they come up with proposals, and industry then has to spend a lot of time trying to challenge them, put them in the right perspective, etc. So why don't we take a different approach? We've got a, a blank sheet of paper. Why don't we all sit down at, right at the start so that industry's involved, because we're the guys that have to pick up the pieces. So we sit down at the start and we sort out what we need, what we want for our businesses, for our industry together, collectively, and have a, a much more cohesive outcome to these processes. Thank you very much, uh, Graham and Cecilia. Uh, the questions are flooding in now. I'll make this the last because we've got to give people the chance to respond. Uh, Cecilia, might you come in and answer your, ask your question? Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Cecilia. Thank you. All right. Sorry, I, I cut out for some reason. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel if they really understood the difference between farm standards and trade standards. I think there's been an awful lot of confusion when people are looking at policy and where we sit. Um, and I suppose that, that is the question. And how many other countries in the world have tr farm standards versus trade standards, in their opinion? Thank you very much. Well, what I'd like to, to do is, is almost go in reverse order. Um, um, but I think the minister should an answer first because that will help shape um, the, the other response of, of the panellists. So I'll go minister first, uh, then Nick, then Alicia, then Richard. So minister, if you can, if you don't mind, kind of speak to, you don't have to answer them all of course, but speak to what you think are the most apposite that you would like, like to respond to, to those uh, questions and issues. Thanks, uh, Philip. Yes, and sorry, I do have a hard deadline at two o'clock uh, to, to go on to my next Zoom call without any uh, uh, breather. Uh, but um, so a few things. Um, the first is on the, Graham's point uh, on consultation. Uh, can I just say from DIT's perspective, we are really keen to have that open door, continual consultation with industry. That's why we've set up the trade advisory groups. When I uh, joined the department, uh, discussed with the Secretary of State what uh, I would like to do. One of these key things was improve our external engagement. Um, so uh, we've got the Strategic Trade Advisory Group uh, on which Nick sits. Um, we've got the trade advisory groups for each sector um, uh, across our country. Uh, we have uh, indeed a trade union advisory group um, so that trade unions can be involved in our work. And we have a uh, a think tank round table regularly for folks like Philip to uh, input their thoughts uh, uh, into um, the, the, the machinations inside DIT. So um, on uh, Graham's suggestion on making sure that uh, industry is there at the outset, absolutely, I agree with you. That's what DIT is seeking to do from our perspective. Um, you'll appreciate it. I'm not, not able to comment on uh, other uh, parts of government um, and uh, there may be very good reasons for why uh, other parts of government do things in a certain way. But from our perspective, I can say that our intention to is to have a very uh, collegiate approach uh, to these things. And uh, that's, that said, uh, it would be remiss of me not to observe that, uh, I, and I respect your interest will be to further uh, your industry. And it's our job to make sure that different interests are balanced uh, across our country. Uh, representing the, the views of the people at large um, through the ballot box. Um, also, in terms of uh, regulatory divergence uh, from MP, the question uh, uh, that uh, uh, Philip read out, um, my understanding, and uh, experts on this call will tell me if I'm wrong, um, is that in some markets like Canada, uh, for cattle, they have different herds depending on what market um, that, uh, that produce is going to. So they have herds of cattle that are going to the US market, which are produced to US standards. And there are herds that are produced for the EU market, which will be the EU plus the UK, because we currently have the same standards, that are produced for our market. And uh, uh, those meet our standards. And uh, therefore, 
a divergence in the future doesn't mean that we cannot sell into a particular market. Um, and this was a point that I, I fear was lost in the Brexit debates uh, in the last parliament, uh, that you know, people said, well, if you aren't part of the EU and you don't have the same standards, you can't sell anything to them. Well, that's wrong. Um, China sells stuff to the EU all the time. And China doesn't have the same standards as the EU, but if you sell something to a market, you meet its SPS standards. And uh, that is uh, what uh, you know, we are upholding in our own market, that only produce that meets our SPS standards can come here. But second, uh, I know that industry will um, be uh, very clued up, um, very agile, uh, as they always have been in, uh, in the United Kingdom, to make sure that they're able to access new markets. And indeed, we want to make that easier. Uh, around the world with those fast growing economies, those very wealthy economies around the world. I think the UAE, for example, imports 80%, 80% of its food. Uh, there's a huge opportunity for Britain to get a bigger slice of the pie. Anyway, I, I should let others uh, uh, come in before two o'clock. Uh, thank, thank you, um, uh, Minister. Nick. Yes, th thanks. Um, uh, I think the, the minister's covered off the, the questions around regulatory divergence and, and consultation with, with the industry there. Um, the, the question on neonics was a, is a very interesting one because, I mean, what the minister said earlier about our food safety laws is absolutely right. And I think it, there has been sort of a bit of unfair commentary that post-Brexit, you know, there's a sort of wild west and all our, all our um, safeguards have gone. And that, that isn't true. You know, the Withdrawal Act does mean that we maintain the same um, the same uh, uh, safety regulations and standards that, that we, we did previously. Um, and I guess that feeds into the regulatory divergence question. We may decide to do things differently in future, but I assume we would do that in consultation and, and, uh, uh, and do forethought. But the point about neonics within that is, of course, very interesting because the issue raised we've banned a certain technology, a pesticide. It hasn't been banned in other parts of the world. It's used there and the products it's used on are imported existed previously. That, that existed as, a, as the UK was a member of the EU. It's, and has been, I think reasonably enough, felt very unfair by, by, by some people. But it's a, it's a fundamental aspect of international trade law where, put it crudely, um, you can't, um, you can't impose import controls because you don't like the way something was produced in the country of export. You can if it's a food safety issue. So we can impose imp have controls on the residues of neonics or other pesticides on our imports, but just because it was used on growing it, um, we're not able to. And I'm afraid that 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 is a uh, a challenge that is is very difficult to, to get over under current trade rules. And so I think there is a great opportunity actually for the UK government to take a, a really strong leadership role in international fora like the WTO and some of the standard setting bodies to maybe begin to introduce some of these concepts uh, and strengthen the ability in trade rules to actually bring in what we call processing and production methods into uh, into trade policy, but that is, to be honest, quite a long uh, <laughs> a long a long game, I, I suspect. And uh, I'm afraid those those kind of issues around pesticides being used, which are banned here, and 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 uh, food being imported, uh, will remain a tricky one. Um, particularly, and it comes back to the point I've made before, if you reduce tariffs, because they, those tariffs exist as a as a kind of crude um, uh, unwieldy, but nevertheless effective uh, import block. And so if you take those away, you then find yourself actually without any other tools to, to exercise that. So, so that, that is interesting. The, just quickly um, on Cecilia's question, I think it's a very good question and, and it depends where you are and what sort of job you do. I think when someone talks about standards, some people think in the very technical sense of standards in terms of trade standards and other standards. Um, and of course, in trade law, standards actually refers to private voluntary standards, not regulations at all. But the general, I think the way that this kind of debate and conversation has been conducted, when we talk about standards, what we are talking about are regulations and rules under which businesses are, offer in a, operate rather in a very broad sense. So uh, they are the rules and regulations 
re, uh, pertaining to agricultural production, farming, food production, etc. And that's the kind of layman's um, uh, view, I suspect. Thanks very much, uh, Nick. Uh, Alicia. I was just going to second Nick on, um, on the distinction that he just made. Um, I think it, it always is food standards or come first. It is all about the quality of the food that, as Richard started with, is the quality of food that people in the UK will be consuming. That's really at the heart of the um, of the question, what will be happening in the future? It's about well-being and, and making sure that trade and uh, food security do not contradict each other because they don't necessarily have to. Um, and um, we really welcome um, everything that the minister has said on when it comes to um, the future opportunities across different supply chains. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of their work. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia. Richard. Uh, a quick summary in the minute before the minister has to go. I think the, um, for me, this is this is not about at all about protectionism. This is not protecting at all costs. This is about a fair and open trade policy that reflects UK domestic policy and how we make the decisions in all of those parts of the system. I think. That, this is what we're striving for, fair competition, and I think that, that the Minister would agree with that, fair competition uh, across as broad a range as possible, um, but one which supports our domestic production. Thank you very much, Richard. And I'd like to thank everybody again. There's some questions we couldn't get to. I'm sorry, my team will connect you with, with the relevant parties. We at Res Publica will continue this work. I think that what remains an issue um, is the fact that under trade law, we can't actually impose the same welfare standards we do domestically uh, internationally. And I think that remains a concern since those welfare requirements rightly do impose a cost upon UK producers. And I particularly like Nick's point about the UK being this advocate for introducing these wider externalities into trade fora. I'm also struck by the National Food Security Report that raised the point that we can have tailored certification processes in these bilateral deals that actually create these um, level playing field for welfare standards within the FTAs. And I think that's something industry should argue for because without them, our British competitor, our British producers will be at a competitive disadvantage. There's no way around that. But with that uh, thought in mind, thanks again to everybody. It's been highly valuable. We've recorded this um, seminar. We will place it online. We will email the link to everybody who registered for the event. And we look forward uh, to doing more work in this area in the future. If you'd be interested in working with us on aspects raised in this panel or indeed um, in this area, do get in touch with us. In the meantime, have a lovely Friday, stay safe and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.